Good morning. Welcome to the Board of Supervisors meeting for August 2nd, 2011. And will our clerk please call the roll? Supervisor Bennett? Here. Supervisor Zaragoza? Here. Supervisor Long? Here. Supervisor Foy? Here. And Supervisor Park? Here. Well, this morning we have for our moment of inspiration, Abby Sunderland, a sailor and adventurer. Abby's been ar around the water and on boats since she was six months old. Since becoming a teenager, she has had her sights set on making history as the youngest person, male or female, to circumnavigate the world. She was inspired by her brother Zach's 2009 trip sailing around the world, in which at 17 years old, he became the youngest person to solo circumnavigate the world. She then decided to undertake a similar adventure at 16 years old. January 2010, she embarked on her voyage from Marina del Rey, California on Wild Eyes, an open 40 racing sailboat, and chronicled her trip through her blog. However, on June 10th, Wild Eyes was rolled 360 degrees by a massive wave. I heard it was a rogue wave, completely disabling her sailboat and ending her trip. Since then, she has been working to tell her story in a book called Unsinkable, A Young Woman's Courageous Battle on the High Seas and through a documentary. And um, Ms. Sunderland, please come up to the microphone. Thank you for being here this morning. I look forward to hearing from you. Yeah, good morning. Thanks so much for having me here this morning. Well, when I was 13 years old, I had a dream, and it was a little bit crazy. I wanted to sail around the world. I wanted to be the youngest person to ever do it. Of course, at 13, I wasn't quite ready, and neither were my parents quite ready for it all. So three years later, I finally had a boat, a sponsor, my parents were willing to let me do this, and I was headed out to live a dream, a dream that the whole entire world pretty much deemed impossible. I was headed out to do this thing I dreamed of for so long, and I was finally getting a chance, and not many people do. Ten days into the trip, people all around the world had said, she won't make it a week out. She won't make it ten days out. She's a little girl. There's no way she can do it. She's got this huge boat. And ten days out, I was already having trouble. In fact, I was going to have to stop. I was going to have to pull into Cabo San Lucas. It, can't, it hit hard, you know, the realization that I was already going to have to stop this trip. So I pulled into Cabo got things fixed, but I was headed out again. I wasn't going to let anything stop me at this point. I was headed down to Cape Horn. Cape Horn, the Mount Everest of sailing. People said, if she can make it a couple weeks out, she can make it to the Pacific, she'll get stopped at Cape Horn. She won't make it around there. I was down towards Cape Horn, and again, I started having trouble, equipment trouble. And it was looking like I might not be able to do it. The thing about sailing is you, you have an idea of your limits, and a lot of times you get pushed to those limits. And then there's times when you get pushed past them. And that was one of those times. Rewiring two autopilot systems in the bilge of a boat all night long when you're exhausted and so tired you can't even understand the people on the phone anymore. And it was a tough night, but I made it around Cape Horn eventually. And I was on the Atlantic Ocean. At this point, I was feeling pretty good about myself. I mean, I'd just gotten around Cape Horn, this thing that not many people sail around. Hardly anyone does it alone. And no 16-year-old had ever done it, and I had. I felt like I was finally starting to prove some of those critics wrong. You know, I was finally starting to prove myself to them and, and to myself, really. I was on the Atlantic Ocean. Got through there with not a whole lot happening other than a few albatross flying into wind generators, flying fish and squid landing all over my boat and uh, catching a seagull on accident. Stopped fishing after that, had really bad fishing luck. But um, yeah, things were going well through there, and then I was about two weeks away from Cape Town, South Africa, and things started looking down again. Uh, it was looking like I might have to stop, in fact. And after a little while, we realized that stopping was really the only responsible thing I could do. I had too many equipment problems, and if I headed out into a whole new ocean, the Indian Ocean, things could get a whole lot worse. I'd be too, much, too far away from land to pull in if I needed to. And so I was headed towards Cape Town. I had a good week, to, a week where I knew I was headed there, and it was one of the hardest things ever, you know, knowing that you're headed towards land. I'd planned this trip to be nonstop. I'd planned to sail around the world six months straight without ever stopping. And here I was, I was stopping. It was taking away the nonstop part of my record. I'd gotten so wrapped up in chasing a record because all the people in the world were... In, I was letting him influence me too much. And here I was all of a sudden, the record wasn't going to be there anymore. 
But I wasn't going to stop me. I was going to keep going. I knew I was going to keep going. There's no way you can give up when you get a chance like this, a once-in-a-lifetime chance. And so I pulled into Cape Town, and I realized how hard it is to walk after spending three months at sea, and how hard it is to talk after spending three months without talking a whole lot. In fact, it's really hard. I had friends who had to hang on to my shoulders when I walked around because I'd occasionally slip or trip, and I was tripping upstairs and downstairs, and it was really funny, actually. But two weeks at Cape Town, I could walk in a straight line, I could carry on a full conversation that not only I could understand, but so could everyone else, and it was time to head out again. And that was one of the hardest things I'd ever done, you know. I'd, spent, I'd always been a shy girl, always quiet. I was never anything special, just a normal 16-year-old girl. I'd never really been a people person until spending three months without them. Then all of a sudden, I couldn't get enough of people. And after two weeks, I was having to leave them again. And I knew just that much better what I was getting myself into when I headed out back onto the ocean. I was going to spend three more months without talking to people, without walking on dry land. And I knew it was really hard. And I knew I was going to have, I was going to run into bigger problems. And I was going to have to push myself again, maybe even further. But leaving Cape Town, I had no idea what was waiting for me just two weeks out. I had no idea quite how far I'd have to push myself when I left Cape Town. And um, a week out, week and a half out, I started having a hard time, getting hit by storm after storm. And when you're down south, these storms roll through hard and fast, and it was taking a toll on the boat. A storm would hit during the day, and I'd have to just hang on, and then at night, I'd have to stay up all night, just pulling the boat back together, trying to fix things, trying to get it in order for the next day, because there was another storm coming. And so about five days like this, and then the sixth day, I got hit by the worst storm I'd ever seen. There were 30-foot waves and 60-knot winds, so I mean, a 30-foot wave, that's like the size of a three-story building. And 60 knots of wind, that's like sticking your head out of the car window on the freeway. And it was pretty fun. I mean, my boat's designed like a surfboard, so you get in these big rollers, and it surfs, and it's as addicting as surfing. And it was designed for that type of weather, so it was handling it well. Now, later on in the day, things started to calm down. I'd had a rough day. My boat was knocked down four times. I had sails that were shredded. My radar got torn off the mast. My engine got soaked. It was a lot of work that needed to be done. And so I was getting down below, starting to get working on everything. And all of a sudden, you know, it dark out. All of a sudden, didn't hear anything, see anything coming. The pole boat just picked up and thrown. And I went flying across the cabin, and I started thinking, all right, it's a knockdown. I'm getting knocked down again. I'd been knocked down four times during the day. One more, no big deal. The boat's going to pop up. But the boat didn't pop up. I went flying across the cabin and hit my head, and everything went black. And I woke up on the roof of my boat with water pouring in. I don't know where it was coming from. It was pitch black. Things were falling around everywhere. And the boat was uh, in the process of rolling back over. And it rolled back over. i just been hit by a rogue wave. Now, nobody's exactly sure what causes them. Sometimes it's two big waves that come together. Sometimes it's just one wave that's had a long time to work its way up. But the wave that hit me was anywhere from 60 to 100 feet. And when you get hit by a 60 to 100 foot wave, bad things happen. And especially when you're in the exact middle of the Indian Ocean. 2,000 miles from South Africa, 2,000 miles from Australia. The two places with major search and rescue stations. So needless to say, I was in one of those spots where sailors look on a map before they leave and go, right there, everything's got to go right. Nothing can go wrong there. That's where it had all gone wrong. And so... I went outside, got outside, checked out what was going on there. My mast was gone. My boom was snapped in half. My tiller was snapped. My engine was soaked. The boat was a disaster. It looked like it had just been rolled. I mean, that's what happens when you tip a boat upside down. It just turns into a mess. And I was in a bad spot. And I jumped back down below. I had a satellite phone. I had talked to my parents. I could call somebody. I could let them know what had happened. I wasn't going to have to start a search and rescue mission. I got downstairs. I found my phone. It was under a foot and a half of water in my bilge. The phone was ruined. I wasn't going to be able to call home. And I started thinking, all right, what do I do now? I'm stranded in the middle of nowhere. And the next thing you do is you, you set off your EPIRP. Uh, I didn't want to have to do that. I pulled my EPIRP off the wall. I sat down with it. I was holding it there. And there's a warning sticker on the back. It says, not set off unless you're in a real emergency. And so I started to think to myself, you know what? I'm not exactly dead yet. I mean, things could be worse. This could, I mean, I'm, I'm fine. The boat's floating. Maybe I'll drift to land in a few days. Do, do I really need to set this off? And eventually common sense went out, and I pushed the button. 
And, you know, pushing the button, it doesn't seem like a big deal. I mean, yeah, I needed to be rescued. I was in a bad place. But at the same time, pushing that button, it was ending my trip, my entire dream. It was ending so much more than that. It was ending the dream and the trip of so many other people. All the people who had followed me, all the people who had worked so hard to pull it off and to help me along on this. And there I was. I was ending it out there. Just a matter of days, the entire, you know, years and years of preparation was just gone. And so I spent 24 hours in the boat. I crawled up in the front compartment, the last dry place on the boat. And the next morning, a plane flew over. I was amazed to see that out there. They were most definitely looking for me. I mean, I, I was a little bit shocked at first. I started thinking, maybe sightseeing passengers or something. But no, they were looking for me. And so they flew over. I told them that my boat was OK and that I was OK. They said, hang on, a rescue ship's coming in 24 hours. Well, 24 hours later, I turned my radio back on, waiting for a call from the ship. But the call didn't come. And it was a few hours later, two, three, four, about five hours later, I started to think, all right, maybe nobody's coming. Stuff happens on the ocean. Maybe they ran into trouble. And so I started to think, all right, what do I need to do to make this boat, get this boat in shape that I can last out here as long as I need to? So I started, you know, I needed to get the engine working, the heater working, my water maker needed to get fixed. I needed to do a bunch of stuff to get this boat in more livable order. And so I got to work on that. There wasn't anything else to do at that point. And so I was down below, and I looked outside, and all of a sudden I see this giant ship filling up my window. And I jumped outside, and there was this massive 150-foot fishing ship literally two feet away from my boat. They got so close, I was beginning to freak out thinking they were going to scratch the paint. But I decided not to worry about the paint and just be happy that somebody had come to pick me up. And so, you know, I took a while. They lowered the dinghy into the water. I got over to their ship thinking, how am I going to go from this tiny little dinghy way down here to this giant ship way up there? And there's this little rope ladder along the side of the boat with little pegs, you know, wooden pegs that are missing and they're all slimy and green. And oh yeah, that, that was how I was going to get up there. And so wasn't, was was looking too good. But the captain, he came over and tied a bunch of lines around me. They weren't going to lose me again. Tied a bunch of lines around me. And right, right as I was about to hop on the front of the boat and jump onto the ladder, this big swell lifted the dinghy up, and the, the big boat was on the other side, so we came right about level. And all the guys on the boat just picked me up and put me on board. And so there it was. My trip had been ended. You know, so much work, so much effort. And it seemed like, it seemed like there should have been, you know, I should have done something else. Something should have happened, you know. Why, why, I kept asking, you know, why did all this happen? There's no good reason for it. And, yeah, I kept on thinking back to, you know, all things work together for the good of those who love the Lord. And, you know, I'd always been a Christian. For those who work for God, you know, things are supposed to work for the good. But I wasn't seeing any good at all in this. In fact, I was seeing a lot of bad stuff. I was seeing media just tearing apart my family and me. And I was seeing just terrible things happening everywhere because of what had happened. I lost my dream. You know, it's not the type of dream I was going to get another shot at. My one shot, and it was gone. And it was tough for a while. I started to think, you know, stuff like that, that's, there's nothing good, good that's going to come out of this. Until I was back for maybe a month or two, and I started going around and talking. And, you know, I went to a couple of schools and stuff thinking, how am I going to inspire kids? Here I am. Um, I've, I've gone out. I've chased a dream. How can I tell kids to chase a dream when they see that my dream's been completely wrecked? But then it started to click, you know. Maybe I'm not supposed to tell people to chase their dreams. Or, or, you know, maybe I am supposed to do that, but maybe I'm supposed to tell them more than chase your dream. Maybe I'm supposed to tell them that there stuff, hard stuff happens, you know. Everybody gets hit by their own rogue wave. And it's what you do with it that matters. And when those hard times, you keep pressing on. Do you reach higher, you know. When you, when you have a goal that's impossible, you know, when you have something that's way too high, you just have to climb higher. You have to reach harder. And I started realizing that there's a whole lot more I, that I've got out of this trip because of the way it ended. And because of how it ended, there's a whole lot more that a lot of people can get out of it. And so it turned into something so much bigger than it ever would have been had everything gone according to plan, like they do so often. You know, everybody's got their story of everything working out perfectly. But what happens when it all falls apart? And what happens when it all falls apart is you realize just how you can take something that looks like a disaster and you realize how you can turn it into something great. And you realize 
that you can never give up and that you have to always keep working hard. And that's the story of me and my boat. So thanks so much for having me out here today. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for coming, and, and it is quite inspiring, and uh, your courage in doing this trip and then being able to find that uh, it really led you to a, a very good place to be able to help others today. So thank you very much for your inspiration. Yeah, thank you. And uh, with that, then, uh, say something. I just, Roy. you know, you, you are very inspiring, and the courage to go and do something and to, to, to take a dream and go do it. You know, it's not only that maybe I didn't complete what I wanted to do, but to inspire yourself and to inspire others just to go try. I think I'd rather have a life of things I tried than not trying at all. Definitely. So congratulations on doing it. Yeah. It was great. Thanks so much. Okay, thank you. Mr. Powers? Well, I'm just going to let you know that you've, you've certainly inspired us up here this morning, but there's also lots and lots of people watching the streaming online, so you're, you're <laughs> getting to a lot of people. Madam Chair, yes. I, I just want to thank you, too, for a 16-year-old. You're very, very, very brave, you know, to, to be out there uh, sailing around the world and, 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 and that little tiny boat and with the uh, three-story foot-high waves. It's just scary as anything. But I, I want to commend you for your bravery and, and also for your sharing. Thank you so much. Okay. I just want to mention, you've become a very effective speaker. Uh, and uh, that uh, is one of those sort of unintended things that you probably weren't thinking about when you were launching uh, launching the sailing around the world. My biggest but, fear. And, and so now, so, so look at all, all of the growth. And so to the extent that you can ex inspire other young people, uh, and your speaking ability is now going to help you do that. So I sure hope you pass this on to lots of other young people in Ventura County. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Sunderland, and I know for sure we're going to be hearing more about you. <laughs> Good luck in your future adventures. All right, thanks a lot. Thank you. And uh, Supervisor Bennett, would you like to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, liberty and justice for all. Okay, and our next item on the agenda then is going to the minutes of our meeting of July 19th. Madam Chair, I'd like to uh, move that we continue the minutes till uh, Roberta, what date? August 9th. Okay, we have a motion to continue. And a second from Supervisor Bennett, if we could all please vote. <laughs> okay, and uh, that passes uh, unanimously. Still so inspired. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> and then our next item on the agenda is agenda review, and I'll turn it over to Mr. Powers. Thank you, Chair Parks. Just two minor corrections this morning. Uh, consent agenda item 17, the agenda header should read Public Works Agency Watershed Protection District. And regular agenda item 32 has been requested to be continued to August 9th. Thirty-two. Thirty-two. Okay. okay. And then, uh, does the board have any requests to also um, make any changes to the agenda? Okay. Then, at this time, can we have a motion to approve the agenda as revised? We have a motion from Supervisor Foy and a second from Supervisor Zaragoza. If we could all please vote. <coughs> Great, that passes unanimously, and we'll go on to item 7, which is our consent agenda items. These are items 10 through 20. We have a motion from Supervisor Foy, a second from Supervisor Zaragoza. And again, if we could all please vote, we're on a roll. We can go right to our public comments. Do we have any public comments today? does not look that way. And then we'll go to board comments and start with uh, Supervisor Foy. Thank you very much. I'd like to adjourn a member of the people on this list. And that is my comment. Thank you. Oh, that was way too fast. <laughs> okay. Help us out here, Supervisor Long. <laughs> yes, good morning. Um, all right, I'm going to start out with a couple things first. Uh, a sales pitch. Um, I'm, I'm in walking again this year for the Making Strides, and it's Saturday, August 13th. 
and I'm on a team called the Pinkettes and the Striders, and here's your little brochure on it. If you'd like to support me, I'd like your support. Um, it benefits, of course, uh, making more birthdays for American Cancer Society. It's at the Harbor Cove Beach. It's a 5K walk, and it's great fun. And please support and um, join the team if you wish. You can go online and join us. And another one related to the American Cancer Society, they are busy. Um, they're busy doing good things, and that is the um, this Sunday, August 8th, from 3 to 8 p.m. at the Mullen Auto Museum in Oxnard is the Bugatti Gala Ball for the American Cancer Society. And if you haven't had a chance to go to this museum, the Bugatti, of course, is a uh, world-known automobile that's worth millions of dollars, and, and they have um, this entire museum is full of uh, automobiles, collectors' items, and it's just a beautiful venue. Uh, this is just an early afternoon, three to eight event, and it also benefits the American Cancer Society. So, if you're interested in that, I can point you in the right direction. Um, and I'm just going to mention that. Oh yes. Are okay. You going to? No. Uh, yeah, mm -hmm. I am. Okay, after ahead. the fairgrounds. Um, well, after the fairgrounds. Well, the fair <laughs> kicks off um, Wednesday. Uh, yeah, August 2nd. Tomorrow. Tomorrow. Um, but on Saturday, uh, August 6th, is the fair parade. And um, following that, if you get a chance, there's the celebrating the grand opening of our new community cat room, Miller's Kitty Cottage, at our own animal, <laughs> Ventura County Animal Services out at the uh, um, uh, at, at animal shelter out on the... Uh, our airport property and it's, it starts at 11 o'clock and it should be great fun to see the final results of that cat cottage, the kitty cottage and, and I, I plan to go and, and um, I don't pet cats because I'm allergic to them but I love looking at them mm -hmm. and hearing their meows. Um, <laughs> uh, I have a list to adjourn in memory of here, um, two folks from the Camarillo community. And just, um, just a, a, a congratulatory and appreciation and a thank you to um, Claire Hope and the, um, the volunteer group, which is hundreds of volunteers. Uh, Claire is the founder and chairperson for the Ventura County Stand Down. And the 19th annual Stand Down took place this last week, and I'm sure you've all read about it in the paper. I attended the kickoff for it. Um, next year is going to be the 20th, so it really will be a big event, and I've committed to her to help with it. And um, I, I just bring it up because, one, it's always very successful. They do a tremendous um, hand up to help veterans who are homeless and helping them to identify what services they qualify for, what, they, what their needs may be, giving them one-day respite, two-day respites. Um, and it's been... Just an amazing uh, volunteer-driven program. Um, the Vietnam Vets started it uh, years ago uh, across the nation. There are over 200 in the United States now. And at the, at the event, um, the kickoff, there were representatives from almost every community in the county, from Ojai, from Oxnard, from Thousand Oaks, from the, the VFWs, the IBEW. The IBEW has been doing the electrical donation, the electrical for a stand down for the entire 19 years just donating their time and energy. Patagonia, blankets every year. Pleasant Valley Lions Club provides lunch. The Ventura Elks Lodge in Oxnard, Thousand Oaks, and Simi Valley, they all contribute different things to it. Flags, um, food, clothes, shoes. Um, it's just an amazing event. And um, next year, uh, I would invite all of us to participate and support Claire Hope and her her tremendous work she does uh, again with this, with this, and celebrating, um, c celebrating and appreciating our veterans, and our veterans who are probably at the lowest point in their life when they're homeless. So mm -hmm. it's a good event, mm -hmm. and that wraps up my comments. Thank you, Supervisor. Yeah, yeah, Madam Chair, I'd like to adjourn uh, the memory of those folks on this list, and also on Wednesday I had the opportunity yeah. to uh, attend the welcoming. Uh, committee ceremonies for the Oxnard Sister City at Plaza Park. This is a uh, Sister City celebration has been going, or interaction has been going on between the city of Ocotan and Oxnard for about 47 years. And during that time, they share uh, business and cultural tra traditions and how to better their uh, governmental ideas and 
and so forth, and also the other things that they work with is public safety, and they've, uh, the city of Oxford has shared uh, some of the old fire trucks with uh, Oklatan, and now it's gotten to the point that they have uh, better fire trucks than we do, so because of the work that we've helped uh, them with. So that was a, a great event, and also I um, had the opportunity to take my grandkids and my daughter back to the airport, Burbank, after being here a couple of weeks, well, more than a couple of weeks. We left Oxnard, and it was 64 degrees, and it was 100 degrees in Burbank, and they're flying into Fort Worth, Dallas-Fort Worth, and they've had over a 100-plus degree temperature for the last 20-plus days. So they called up and said, well, we're here. We miss Oxnard and the 64 degree temperatures. So anyway, um, that they, uh, they, they went back home. So we're going to miss them. That's all. Thank you. Supervisor Bennett. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to ask the board to adjourn in memory of the people on this list. Uh, and um, uh, the one thing I wanted to um, uh, emphasize, uh, the two things on my list are ones that Supervisor Long's already covered, so I appreciate uh, uh, your uh, coverage and support of those, and that was uh, to talk about the stand down and the efforts by Claire Hope uh, uh, and, and, and moving that forward. I'm glad to hear that you're going to be involved next year. That's, uh, that's great. Um, good for you. Uh, and that is a remarkable thing uh, here in the, in the city of Ventura that uh, has become a great tradition and a real help uh, when a veteran gets, gets themselves in that spot. Uh, and the other thing I was going to mention is the Animal Services Department's grand opening of uh, the Kitty uh, Cottage. Um, and the final thing is I'd like to thank Supervisor Long for uh, uh, regularly working with uh, Making Strides in the Breast Cancer, breast cancer effort and stuff. Look forward to your support. Yeah, you'll get it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. And that concludes, oh, I'll go with mine first and then conclude our board comment. And that is, um, well, first of all, we all know that today is National Ice Cream Sandwich Day. So I'm just reminding you just in case you, um, you forgot. And uh, also, this day in history, 1776, members of Congress affixed their signatures to an enlarged copy of the Declaration of Independence. And also in 1909, the first Lincoln penny was issued. Uh, as far as events, uh, I also, uh, the, my office actually moved physically this uh, last week, oh. thanks to the help of GSA, Great Service Always, and IT. And uh, we're happy to be live and online and almost phones working, and <laughs> we're just uh, delighted to be there. But on the day that we moved in, we had our first letter, and it was the invitation to the Kitty Cottage oh. grand opening. Ms. Miller is uh, a resident of Thousand Oaks who really wanted to do something to remember her daughter. And so we're all looking forward to attending, and I hope you'll all be there. Petting cats or not petting cats. Uh, also, uh, last week where I was able to attend uh, the last uh, big public event called Open Borders, and that's the old Borders uh, bookstore in Thousand Oaks, which the county purchased from uh, Larry Jans and is making into a health clinic, had, a, had about a, a month or two of emptiness and uh, being a vacant building and the county allowed Mr. Jans to use that and open it up to some really good art, uh, both sculptures, uh, Ansel Adam prints and other kinds of art there as well as musical performances from some old rock bands to some eclectic music and really brought in some life to uh, Thousand Oaks that uh, we all uh, needed, I think. I <laughs> Did you Jefferson, attend? Jefferson Airship. Jefferson oh. Airship, and I heard it sounded just like the, uh, the real thing. Yeah, they so rocked. They rocked. <laughs> all right. And <laughs> it's good. The youth can find out about what us old timers. Well, real music is like <laughs> Yes. <laughs> no, it's good music. All right. Uh, with that, then um, I'll go ahead and um, move on to our next item which is our regular agenda items and item 30 and it's our CEO's office uh, regarding the adoption of some classifications and salary ranges. Good morning Madam Chairman, members of the board. You have before you classifications in the health care agency and the modification of a classification for an exempt position that already exists in the CEO's office. In the case of those in the health care agency, it is in the behavioral health area. This is the creation of classifications as a result of a request by behavioral health and negotiations with the SEIU. This establishes positions in the crisis 
team unit that are entitled to be paid at the same rate as the regular behavioral health uh, professionals who are not on the crisis team. It also entitles them, based on their hours, to be paid overtime. As you might imagine, a crisis team is subject to a fair amount of call-out and extended periods. We would be in a position otherwise that it would be a career difficult choice for someone to decide to leave regular behavioral health and go to the crisis team when they're no longer entitled to overtime and yet subject to even more of the same call-out. So this was an appropriate discussion with the SEIU and behavioral health. It also provided for an agreement for us to create per diem classifications of the same type that can be used for fill-in. Because you never staff enough to cover all of the potentialities, but you should have the ability to bring in per diems to fill for those positions as necessary. The other is a modification in the position of the executive assistant in the CEO's office that takes that position from non-exempt to uh, from exempt to non-exempt. That would indicate that uh, individuals in that position, just as the 17 other executive secretaries, are entitled during those long hours to be paid overtime rather than granted administrative leave. So they would be paid for hours worked. And that's the last change that we made, and that would be now there would be 18 of the executive assistants out of 27 who are in that category. Thank you. That brings them all in then, right? Good. We're working um, on them. Are there any questions or a motion? No, I think that's good. I think we we'll bring that in there. Good. Thank you, John. It's good to see you again. I haven't seen you here for a while. Hey, keep me locked up. <laughs> By the way, I would like to thank uh, Melanie, Roy, and the SEIU for sitting down and working that issue out on the crisis team. Nothing got delayed. No services got disrupted. But everybody sat down and talked their way through it. And we're fortunate that they've got that kind of relationship. Okay. We have a motion from mm -hmm. Supervisor Foy, a second from Supervisor Long. If we could all please vote. Thank Great. And thank you. Know, thank you, Mr. Nicole. Good to see you again. Our next item is item 31. And this is uh, regarding uh, a different kind of surcharge fee at the Simi Valley Landfill. Good morning, Chair Parks, members of the board, Mr. Powers, Reddy Pakala with the Water and Sanitation Department of the Public Works Agency. Uh, this item, as I said, Mr. So Parks, is uh, for an annual adjustment to the county surcharge fee at the Simi Valley Landfill uh, for calendar year 2012. Uh, back in 2002, your board approved a methodology of how to uh, adjust this uh, county surcharge fee on an annual basis. The methodology includes preparation of a, what we call a market rate area study, MARS, uh, for 29 landfills stretching from San Diego to Paso Robles along the coastline and Coyalinga to the north. And our staff within IWMD prepared 2011 MARS report. Based on this MARS report, we are recommending increasing the county surcharge fee by 3.14% from the current $2.55 per ton to $2.63 per ton. And if uh, uh, this fee will be applicable to both in-county and out-of-county material that's brought to the Simi Valley landfill. Uh, we are estimating that it will generate approximately $2.6 uh, 2 million for calendar year 2012. Our staff within IWMD will verify, collect, and deposit these funds into the general purpose revenues. That concludes my verbal presentation. I'll be glad to take any questions you have. Thank you. Does the board have any questions? I just got a quick question real quick. Supervisor Foy? This um, fee, though, is not based on any ex additional expense we have. It's just based on your survey, right? Uh, it's based on the methodology approved by your board, yeah. which is tied to what we call a mean market rate of all the 29 landfills. Right. And uh, is everybody else went up, or last time that we had this fee, it wasn't as high as, I mean, let's say if we did this and you increase this, if you redid this thing again three, four, five, six months from now, would our fee still go up? I mean, are we just taking some medium average? Is that what it yes, is? Yes, it's, it's a median, median. Uh, medium of all the 29 landfills right. in Southern California and, as I said, Paso Robles, all the way to Paso Robles and Coelinga. Okay. 
Right. Is that how the rest of these landfills charge their rates to, or is that they all have some different method? Well, e e each uh, landfill may have a different methodology, yeah. but for this particular landfill, which happens to be a private landfill, and this was the methodology approved by your board and right, accepted right. by the landfill owner. So the 2.6 million, how much of that is, in, how much more is coming in over last year? Uh, last year it's, year? it's uh, we're estimating $60,000. 60000 more. Yeah. Okay. And this just comes from the residents, wherever else, people who bring whatever to the landfill. If it's a well, waste hauler or if I bring my pickup truck or whatever for a ton. Well, this would uh, establish what we call a maximum gate rate at the Simi Valley landfill. Mm -hmm. And once a maximum gate rate is established, then Simi Valley landfill will provide an annual report. As part of the report, they would identify the different rates that will be charged. And uh, so the people, if you are going to the gate, for example, you'll be paying the maximum gate rate that's established for a given year. Mm -hmm. uh, for others, like cities, uh, they may have a different rate yeah. uh, negotiated by waste management. Right. Okay. It will eventually have impact on the solid waste uh, rates for uh, cities and uh, county areas who take the solid waste to Simi Valley landfill. Right. Okay. All right. Thanks. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you. We have a motion from Supervisor Bennett, second from Supervisor Zaragoza. I'd note about uh, five years ago, I believe, I, uh, the board actually approved using some of this for our county parks. And while we are not doing that anymore, the new surcharge that we're looking for out of county trash will be able to make that happen too. So if we could all please vote. Passes on a 4 1 with Supervisor Foy uh, dissenting. And um, that, I thank believe, you. thank you, Mr. Pakala, concludes our uh, regular agenda item. Can we have a motion for our correspondence agenda? Motion by Supervisor Foy, second by Supervisor Bennett, and we have an opportunity to vote yet again. And uh, uh, at this point, uh, we will go into closed session, correct? Yes. Yes. Not and I don't, you don't anticipate an announcement, so none of us will. <laughs> and then uh, we'll be back here then for our time certain. Our first one is at 10 a.m. Thank you. I hit the gavel, I might make babies cry or something. <laughs> Hi, good morning, everybody. We're back from our uh, closed session on our August 2nd, 2011 Board of Supervisors meeting, and our 10 a.m. time certain is uh, proclaiming World Breastfeeding Week, and uh, yeah. hooray for that. <laughs> Uh, having been a, a, a breastfeeding mother for at least four kids and being able to uh, enjoy the uh, absolute the, the benefits of prolactin and uh, actually a little bit of birth control and health and uh, I, I am very happy for all of you and most particularly for your children who are benefiting and probably will receive those benefits throughout their lives as a result of the good um, nutrition they're getting early on. I'll go ahead and read this resolution and then uh, come down there and present it. Uh, so the resolution is, uh, I guess I'm giving it to Dr. Orchard, so I'll come down there, and also Patty Zah. It says, whereas the people of Ventura County are deserving of good health, and whereas all available knowledge indicates that human milk optimally enhances the growth, development and well-being of the infant by providing the best possible nutrition, protection against infection and allergies, and the, mater and the promotion of maternal and infant bonding, 
And whereas breastfeeding promotes healthier mothers and benefits society through lower health care costs for infants, a healthier workforce, stronger family bonds, and less waste, and whereas breastfeeding is economical and environmentally friendly, providing its benefits at little or no cost, and whereas breastfeeding is recognized by major medical organizations such as the American Academy of Pediatrics, the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, the American Academy of Family Physicians, the American Dietetic Association, the National Association of WIC Directors, UNICEF, and WHO, as the preferred method of infant feeding and support breastfeeding throughout the early years of life. And whereas the Breastfeeding Coalition of Ventura County, who we have before us today, exists to support breastfeeding as the cultural norm for all babies and to promote maternal and child health through breastfeeding education, support, and outreach in Ventura County, and also great, a great support group for mothers. And whereas the Breastfeeding Coalition of Ventura County and La Leche League celebrates World Breastfeeding Week, August 1st through 7th, 2011, which is proclaimed by the World Alliance for Breastfeeding Action along with the World Health Organization and UNICEF. And whereas the families of Ventura County need reliable sources of information to make an informed choice about the care and feeding of their of their infants, and, and it also helps keep them quiet. <laughs> now, therefore, be it resolved that the Ventura County Board of Supervisors does hereby proclaim August 1st to 7th, 2011, as Real Breastfeeding Week. It's the only way I could talk on the phone. <laughs> and with special emphasis on breastfeeding promotion, urges all citizens to seek reliable nutrition information and to support breastfeeding as a high priority for healthier babies in Ventura County. So I'll come down there and present this. I also know one of my staff is here uh, on her day off to support you all, so with her little 13-month-old. Uh, <laughs> I might mention also that uh, our county does have a lactation room if anyone needs it up on the fourth floor. <laughs> send this to you, and if you uh, have anything you'd like to say, and then we can also take a photo, and, okay. and right on up. <laughs> well, I've got stuff to talk about with the awards, but we can do okay. that in a second. So. Okay, so we'll you will accept okay. this, and then our, our next item, too, we have uh, another item related to this. Well, thank you very much. On behalf of the Breastfeeding Coalition of Ventura County, we're always honored that you give us time here uh, during your meeting, and we're so excited to share this with all of the residents of Ventura County. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Patty Zoll, and I'm the co-chair with the Breastfeeding uh, Coalition, co-chair for the awards. Um, Dr. Patty Ochard is our chair for this year and has been doing a fabulous job. As uh, Supervisor Parks uh, talked about what the, the goals and objectives are of the Breastfeeding Coalition, I don't need to go back over that, but I do have to say that I'm only one little spoke in this wonderful wheel of women that make this group happen. We all put in time, uh, extra time on weekends and doing functions and doing outreach and coming up with fabulous ideas. And apparently our, our coalition in this county has been getting some recognition from the state breastfeeding coalition. So they've been coming to us to borrow some of our forms and ideas and, and so we feel pretty proud about that because we're very much a grassroots effort. So again, we appreciate the time that you give us in front of you each year. And we feel it's so important to acknowledge employers and key people that have a role in supporting and advocating for breastfeeding. So we have our annual Breastfeeding Friendly Award. 
and this award program has been going strong for probably close to six years. Um, we've got four categories of awards that we're presenting today. So if I could just say a little bit about each award winner and call them up to get their certificate and their plaque. We have the large business category, and the winner this year of the large business category was Amgen in Thousand Oaks. <laughs> Caitlin Maloney what is the employee that nominated Amgen, that Amgen is her employer. And part of the information that Caitlin provided to us about Amgen is that they provide several private lactation rooms with refrigerators and padded rocking chairs for on-site employees. Amgen is noted for implementing a work from home program that allows Caitlin to breastfeed on demand at home. And actually her quote is, my manager has been very supportive of my flexible work situation, which allows me to continue providing my daughter with the best possible start to life. As a result, I feel more loyalty to Amgen than ever and will work very hard to maintain a lifelong career with them. And so Caitlin's actually going to accept the award for Amgen today. She's going to come up with her beautiful baby. For our small business category, the winner this year is the Sierra Vista Family Medical Clinic in Simi Valley. The employee that nominated her employer is Charlena Pina, and accepting the award is Karina Barajas. Okay, so come on up. A little bit of information, Sierra Vista Family Medical Clinic is very pro-breastfeeding. The physicians support the breastfeeding efforts not only of their patients, but also of the staff at the clinic. And Charlena's quote is, I breastfed for almost three years in a row. I'm expecting baby number three and look forward to breastfeeding and returning to work with all the support we get. We currently have four moms pumping and sharing advice and support to one another. I love it. I plan to return after maternity leave and create a mommy club support group for breastfeeding. That's an awesome place to work. For our nonprofit category, the winner this year is Oxnard College. <laughs> the employee that nominated Oxnard College is Della Nulo, and accepting the award today is Vice President Dr. Erica Indrogenis. <laughs> I did it right. Okay. Oh, sorry. I was saying. So, Della was granted additional leave time in order to continue breastfeeding her daughter. Expressing breast milk for Della is a slower than usual process, so the only way she could continue nursing her daughter past five months was to take an extended leave, and the college granted her that leave. Her quote is, if I had to return to work at six months, my daughter would no longer be getting the wonderful nutrition she only gets currently through breast milk. This was an amazing opportunity, and not many employers would do this for an employee. They allowed me the extra time for my daughter. It has changed my life. I will forever be grateful. So congratulations. <laughs> Okay, and our last award winner is in the category of physician. And a few years ago we added this category because we felt that it was so important that, um, that physicians would be uh, supportive and um, encouraging for moms to breastfeed exclusively. Um, the winner this year in the physician category is our very own Dr. Patty Otchard. <laughs> Dr. Patty's patient, Karina Martinez, nominated her for, for this award. 
and Karina began seeing Dr. Patty when breastfeeding problems occurred. Dr. Patty supported Karina, taught her skills so she, so she could continue to breastfeed exclusively even when her son was diagnosed with a food allergy that no elimination diet cured. Karina's quote is, the biggest support was her advice and all the answers I received to my weekly questions. I felt like we were a team. Dr. Patty looked at many of my specific questions and called me back with answers immediately. My son is now nine months old, and thanks to Dr. Patty, breastfeeding is still successful. Well, that concludes our awards. Okay, do we do dare try to put all the babies and moms together in one photo? It could be fun. If you all like to try to get in one photo, there's a lot of us. <laughs> you just take, have them in arms and come on down? You want to bring your baby, sir? All right, let's go for it. Big old baby photo, how about that? Oh, camera's back there? All right, and facing. If you have a camera and want to take a photo, you can go back there and we'll take a picture of us looking this way. Yeah. Hey. Yeah. Oh, it's good to have an arrow when you have an arrow. So we're all going to face this way and have a camera taking it from this way. Oh, there's there's a photographer right there. <laughs> Put them by the speaker. Speaker of the house. <laughs> 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 business leader there. Exactly. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> now don't pass. <laughs> 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 Shiloh, don't look good. Do you okay? Do you need to come see over me? No, uh -uh. Okay. <laughs> I know. <laughs> yeah. Keep up your good work. Thank you. Okay. Great. No, 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 no. no. <laughs> Feature business leader. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> to our next agenda item. If the uh, moms and babies would like to uh, exit, we'll, we'll go on to our next item. And uh, we're hoping to get that picture up on our website at ventura.org so you'll get a chance to take a look at it. <laughs> our next item on our agenda then is our uh, item 23. And this is presentation of a resolution to Rodney Fernandez, the director of Cabrillo Economic Development Corporation, and Supervisor Long is going to be doing this. Well, Rodney, I'm not sure how to follow all that. What do you think here, huh? No way. Huh? No way. Well, I, I am very honored, frankly, to be able to uh, invite Rodney in to give a board resolution to acknowledge his life's work 
um, as Rodney retires from this path of work and, and moves on to, I expect, many other paths of interest and enjoyment. Um, and invite uh, certainly Rodney to come up and, and we'll acknowledge uh, who's here with us. I'm going to read the highlights. Obviously, there's 37 years of experience in the community development field, and I think most of us know of uh, Rodney and of the great work of Cabrillo. But 30 outstanding years as the founder and the executive director of Cabrillo Economic Development, which has become the largest community development corporation in Ventura County. Uh, Rodney's leadership and vision built the grassroots organization Cabrillo Improvement Association, which grew to become Cabrillo Economic Development that served our county, Santa Barbara, and adjacent areas in Los Angeles County. And under his tenure as the executive director, Rodney's developed and constructed 34 projects totaling 1,600 affordable rental and ownership homes. Yay! <laughs> Rodney oversaw the development of the CEDC's Property and Asset Management Division, which manages seven, 714 affordable rental apartments in its portfolio, and has led efforts by the organization to funnel more than $348 million in real estate development through the organization's activities over the 30 years. The startup of Neighborhood Works Home Ownership Center at CEDC has assisted nearly 700 families into home ownership through loan packaging totaling more than 62 million and assisted more than 8,300 families to purchase a home through education and counseling. And no better, no better thing to do than to help someone get into a home that they can both afford and, and manage and love and, and raise a family. CEDC is recognized as an exemplary member of the Net Neighborhood Works America Network, the, co the con country's leader in affordable housing and community development, all of this under Rodney's direction. Rodney's vision and commitment guided CEDC to use its resources to provide foreclosure prevention counseling to more than 2,500 families. He was instrumental in starting the first ever Ventura County Housing Trust Fund with contributions um, nearing a million dollars, which will make more affordable homes available for working families, seniors, and individuals with special needs. Rodney has been recognized at the local, state, and national level with numerous accolades and awards for his expertise in community development, organizational development, and executive leadership, such as the Alice McGrath Warrior for Justice Award from the Ventura County Mexican American Bar Association, Pacific Coast Business Times, Who's Who in Education and Civic Leadership, KCET, Union Bank of California Hispanic Heritage Local Hero of the Year Award, and many other exemplary, but I think those things that really matter most to Rodney, knowing Rodney, are those personal thank yous he gets from the families who move in and have a place finally that provides them more than just shelter, more than just safety, but a home for them and their families. I look for some of the prior um, accolades and celebrations of, of uh, the good work of CEDC and came across a letter from Marcella Cervantes, who lives in Paseo del Rio River Park with her husband and three daughters. And it was a special thank you to Rodney for, making, for thinking of us, as she said, and making our lives extremely happy, for making the lives of our children better. We're privileged to live here. We feel very safe. Now we have access to programs on site which are very educational for our children and for ourselves. My six-year-old Amanda was struggling in school and looking at repeating the first grade, but then I sent her to the homework club every day here on, at the housing, uh, at the home uh, center where they live. And Maria worked with her and helped her, and she helped Amanda pass into second grade with that homework support. So it's, it's the programs, it's the services that are offered and connected and integrated into all of the housing development that Caprio does. It supports the family, and it certainly is an um, a investment both in our, uh, our current uh, folks who need homes, but investment in generations who will, who will know that they're supported by their community and know that, um, that they're loved and embraced by people who care about them, and Rodney, you have been that care giver, that care supporter, that person who knows the importance of providing that kind of a home to people who are in need in our county. So 
37 years, 30 years on the home development side. I invite you up. I know that you want to share some words with us. And I know there are others here who would like to speak also and invite them up. Madam Chair, before Ronnie says a couple of words, I just want to echo what the supervisor said. And I've had the pleasure of working with Ronnie for years and years, especially when I was in the city of Boston. He had numerous projects like Simmons Street and Meadow Street. And I remember going to one of those homes, as was mentioned, that this one family was really proud of having their own home. And your staff and you provided that effort. And you're working on the Gonzales Road project now, too, that I think is going to help many, many people. And the River Park was there for the ribbon cutting ceremonies. And it was mentioned in the resolution that they have a little section there for the kids to do their homework and for families to gather and so forth. I want to commend you for your many, many, many years of service to the community for providing affordable housing. And I think you're going to leave a good staff and a good legacy behind you. So I want to thank you for that. Thank you so much. Thank you, John. Since we're, I'm going to say it before you get started. I said some things to you before, and I think it's all been repeated. But I just want to let you know I feel the exact same way, just tremendous respect for what you've done for 37 years. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor. And the same also, just not only providing housing, but also providing hope. And that means a lot to people at the edge. So thank you for your good work. Thank you. I think hope is the good word. And I think you have a lot to be proud of. So thank you. All right. Thank you, Supervisor. Well, I'm uh, I'm taking a deep breath here because uh, I need to. And your your kind your kind remarks your kind remarks uh, uh, create cause me to take a deep breath. Uh, thank you very much. I really appreciate it. It's it's very humbling, and it's also very uh, appropriate that that we are here together because, uh, in fact. Uh, uh, my ability to be a service to this community <clears throat> and our company's ability to be a service started with uh, the county. Um, I want to give you just a little bit of a, a history here. So I grew up in Los Angeles and uh, was able to go to college and went to work for the redevelopment agency. And I stumbled onto this wonderful place when I was in college because I used to backpack quite a bit in the local mountains. Uh, particularly Santa Paula Creek, <clears throat> and I fell in love with Santa Paula. And I decided uh, when I was working in the redevelopment agency, uh, because of my asthma, I'd been looking to get out of L.A. for some time, and I said, well, Santa Paula's it. And uh, so then the next thing is you got to get a job, right? Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> and so I, I uh, you know, got turned down quite a bit. But lo and behold, uh, Johnny Johnston, uh, the uh, infamous, uh, famous Johnny Johnson uh, hired me in 1974 when he was the director of the Support Services Agency to be his administrative assistant, and that started my career here in the county. Uh, the next year, the county had a, a budget crisis, and they moved to consolidate some commissions, and one of the commissions that was left standing was the Human Relations Commission. And they needed uh, somebody to help that commission uh, move forward. <clears throat> so I applied for the job. And lo and behold, Supervisor Maggie uh, Erickson Kildee was the chair of that board, uh, who, along with Gerard Kapusik, uh, hired me to uh, take on that post. And that was really important for me personally because when I left L.A., I knew I wanted to stay in the, in the field of community development, but I... You know, you don't know how these things evolve, right? And so here I was able to uh, begin working with the community again. And uh, through that, uh, in 1975, the Cabrillo Village crisis erupted, and the leaders there came to the Human Relations Commission asking for help, and there I was, and there we were. Uh, the county was very, very supportive, uh, both at the Board of Supervisor level and at the, and at the staff level. And I think most importantly at the spiritual level, because that was such a tremendous undertaking that they were committed to do, which was to take responsibility for their own community, but they realized they needed partners in, their, in order to do that. And so here we were. <coughs> uh, 
So here's my fondest memory. And it happened right here in this uh, chamber. Uh, in the in the 80s, uh, based on the experience, the success of Cabrillo Village, uh, Rancho Sesby uh, found itself in another crisis in 1979. And the county in 1981 asked uh, the new CEDC startup, which the county uh, provided uh, startup funds to take on this task. And it was a pretty big task. Uh, the growers had basically evicted uh, people from the camp that looked like another Cabrillo village. Uh, they bought off many, many families, but about 100 families remained and stuck it out. <clears throat> and uh, so we went through a lot of planning and a lot of searching for a new site and finally found one out on the current 126 and ran the project through very carefully because we knew it was going to get uh, appealed. And uh, uh, lo and behold, the Planning Commission turned it down. And what's really ironic is that the deciding vote uh, turned out to be one of my ex-junior high school teachers from my old neighborhood. <laughs> so it showed you how influential I was. I couldn't swear. I couldn't swear. Uh, and here's another connection. Ed Jones was uh, my junior, was at that same junior high school, was my after sports uh, uh, teacher in junior high school. And so whenever I would come up here, he would tell the whole world what a brat I was. <laughs> but I showed a lot of promise. <laughs> so uh, the Planning Commission turned down the project. And, uh, you know, so we had a lot of hearings here. Packed and uh, overflow out in the fountain area, you know, with supporters. And uh, that's the project that Karen Flock uh, uh, cut her teeth on. She jo she joined in 1981, and you know, it was a real uh, it was a real challenge. So, the, so this is 1985, and <clears throat> I wasn't <clears throat> worried about it because you know when you go into this business, you count votes, right? And so I figured, you know, the Board of Supervisors was going was to uh, overturn it, and they did. But here's the key vote. Jim Doherty, bless his heart, and may he rest in peace, the supervisor from CME at that time, uh, very quiet, very conservative, very noble man, <clears throat> was quiet throughout the whole deliberation. And this was a hearing that lasted two days. And so when it got time for him to vote, those of you who know Jim, he goes, uh, I'm going to support this project because these folks work very hard and they put food on our table and they deserve better and they're looking to take responsibility for their own lives. So they've got my vote. That was it. <clears throat> so... I want to just uh, uh, conclude by uh, by thanking you all, and uh, you know we can't do our work without uh, a, a partnership at many many levels. And it's been uh, heartwarming over the years to know that, from a philosophical standpoint, uh, the board of supervisors and their staff, uh, your staff over the years have just been tremendous to work with. Uh, it's we couldn't do our work without their uh, partnership in the trenches and obviously your uh, political support at the end. Uh, so we want to uh, acknowledge you for all that you've done over the years and your staff and the Cabrillo board and staff. Uh, uh, Deborah Scheiber is here representing the Cabrillo board and there's a handful of, of uh, a prominent Cabrillo staff and I will note that uh, there are four people in the room uh, that go back to the 70s with this whole effort. Uh, uh, Jesse, Laura, and myself, and Karen. So you're looking at about 120 years of experience <laughs> at this at this wonderful uh, work that we do. Uh, so without the board and the staff, uh, I wouldn't be here in front of you. And, and it's because of them and because of their commitment uh, to our work that CDC is in great hands, and it's continue to do. It's going to continue to do great things. Uh, you know, part of our effort over the years has been not only to serve the community, but to serve it with integrity. And I think that we've been able to do that. And because of that integrity, uh, our ability to continue to be a, a partner with you all is, is I'm, I feel very good 
is going to continue to last. So thank you all very much, and we'll see each other, I'm sure. Thank you. I have this resolution on behalf of the board, and, and I'd like to certainly have the um, CEDC uh, folks come up and we'll do a group picture. But first, we have youth from CEDC Housing here to present a token of appreciation to Rodney. Anna Lopez, Bernice Reyes, Gisela Rodriguez, and Kenya Salcido. And they have a presentation. <laughs> sure, sure, sure. And please. Into the microphone uh, this is an appreciation gift for you, Ronnie Fernandez, for your retirement. This is also a way of us saying thank you for building homes for families in Ventura County. Via Fernandez. Via Fernandez honors the legacy of the founder of Carrillo Economic Development Corporation. With this archetype of a Carrillo community, CEDC families would like to give back the gift of a beautiful and wholesome community to Rodney Fernandez. This was made by the Friday Night Live Youth Club. This archetype model has a vegetable garden, a strawberry field, a soccer field, and a community room. My name is Priscilla Cisneros. I work in the community building um, division, and I get to work with um, the youth groups that we're developing. And so um, Brady Rourke, who is the architect for um, Central Station, Fillmore Central Station, was um, the one that provided the model. And the youth took it upon themselves to decorate it and create a beautiful community garden, and then also, um, you know, talk about the things they like to do in the community room and things like that. So with a lot of appreciation from the families to you, Rodney. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, let's put this in the front. Yeah. You guys hold on to this and put it in the front. Yeah, and if everyone can come actually over here, there's more space. Okay, come on over here. Thank you, Supervisor Long, for bringing that forward, and our best wishes to Rodney. And our, uh, brings us to our 10.30 time certain item on resolution. We have ratification, that one, 24? Hmm. Ratification of a behavioral health uh, director contract with telecare, and Ms. Roy is here. Good morning, Chairman Parks, members of the board, and Mr. Powers. This is Melanie Roy from the Behavioral Health Department. Item 24 uh, contains uh, actually six recommendations for your consideration. Uh, the first one is uh, to consider the uh, contract for fiscal year 11-12 for the Telecare Corporation. This contract is for the residential treatment facilities that are located out on Lewis Road in Camarillo. There are three long-term social rehab facilities and one board and care facility. Uh, the uh, rates, there are slight increases in the rates. The rates are based on actual costs. We settle the cost at the end of the year. 
um, the second um, item or second um, uh, recommendation is for a contract again with Telecare Corporation. This is for the EDIP program. Uh, this serves 25 to 30 uh, youth between the ages of 18 to 25. These are individuals who are identified as having early signs of schizophrenia, and this is a um, early intervention program to mitigate the effects of that illness, intervene early, and change the trajectory of that illness to hopefully um, cause these individuals to have uh, less uh, symptoms, less side effects. Um, very important program. We're really excited about that one. Um, item three is uh, our contract with Recovery Innovations. Uh, Recovery Innovations uh, provides uh, p uh, um, positions for peer support specialists and recovery coaches uh, who work side by side with our clinicians in our MHSA programs. Um, that item also contains um, uh, a rent increase. They, they sublet um, space from us at the Williams Building, which allows them to co-locate with our Oxnard Adult Clinic. It's a great synergy. Clients can come in. They can get connected to RECA, uh, participate in recovery classes, um, make connections, um, hopefully um, engage in their program. And uh, there is a, a rent increase there because there's uh, more rental space and um, also um, some common space that was uh, now included in their um, rent agreement with the county. Um, the fourth recommendation is a recommendation for IDEA Engineering. I've spoken about that project with you before. IDEA Engineering provides uh, the universal prevention strategies for our uh, prevention early intervention programs. One of the things that we're really working on with them is to decrease the stigma associated with mental illness. Uh, with 22 million people in the United States suffering from some form of mental illness, um, a lot of those um, individuals are between the ages of 18 to 25 year old. Um, it's that particular group in particular that does not seek help because of the stigma even more so than individuals who are older. Um, and of course, intervening early really does change the course of the disease. And so it's very important that we get the word out there and help people understand that mental illness is a chronic disease, just like diabetes, and that there should be no shame in seeking treatment. So that's um, primarily one of the efforts that IDEA Engineering is working on with us. Um, recommendation five is for the Ventura County Medical Resource Foundation, who acts as a fiscal intermediary for us um, in our programs um, for uh, educational stipends. Uh, we have a number of programs, and there's about $216,000 in stipends that they help us manage. Recommendation six is for the California Institute of Mental Health, and that is the entity through which we contract um, that um, provides a lot of training to our department in evidence-based practice. Uh, it's been very important for us to make sure that when people come to our department for treatment that we are doing things for them that have data behind them, and uh, we know that the types of interventions that we're providing are successful. So California Institute of Mental Health has done a significant, significant amount of training for our clinicians and will continue to do so next year. Some of the increase in that contract is due to the fact that some of the training that we intended to do in fiscal year 10-11 is now going to either um, happen in 11-12 or will continue into an 11-12. So that's uh, why there's an part of the reason why there's an increase in that contract. If you have any questions. I know it's a long board letter. <laughs> Thank you. Are there questions to Mr. Powers? Uh, just a comment uh, that uh, the notion of prevention of serious mental illness, particularly those suffering from schizophrenia, is really uh, a great sea change in approach. And hats off to Melanie and the department for really being out front on this issue. Thank you. And, uh, that EDIP program, that is uh, not a residential program, is that correct? It's, a, it's an intensive community-based program. It's an ACT model uh, program where um, individuals receive really intensive case management wraparound type services in the community and linkage to um, treatment and other supports. Thank you. Uh, does the board have any other comments or questions on this? If not, can we please have a motion? Motion by Supervisor Zaragoza, second, second by Sup Supervisor Bennett. And uh, with that, if we could all please vote. 
Thank you, Ms. Roy. Thank you very much. And all of this is uh, reviewed with uh, outcomes and performance outcomes, and I think that will really help us to continue uh, moving in the right direction. Our uh, next item on the agenda is our 1030 time certain, a presentation of a resolution honoring Kim Hawking for his 38 <coughs> years service in the, in the county. And uh, I'll turn it over to Supervisor Zaragoza, but I'll get a second chance to comment. Yeah, Kim, if you'd like to come forward, uh, I'd like to read this resolution uh, from the Board of Supervisors. And i just like to share a little something that um, I got the, uh, his resume. In his resume, if we were to put every single item that he's done here in his resume, I'd probably need three of his uh, resolutions to, to share the good things that you've done for, for the community. So what I'm going to read does not really reflect all the good things that you've done, but uh, I'm honored to read this uh, resolution as we, as we proceed. And this is a resolution from the Board of Supervisors honoring uh, Kim Hawkins as he re retires with 38 years of service to the County of Ventura. Whereas in 1970, Kim began his long career with the County of Ventura Planning Division. And whereas throughout the years of 1975 to 1985, Kim served as a manager and supervisor for various comprehensive countywide planning programs and residential permits. It was around this time that Kim began running a hobby that he has followed throughout his life. Whereas in 1985 through 1987, Kim was a senior administrative budget analyst for the chief administrator's office, while also working as a position for LAFCO. In 1987, Kim began his uh, yet another phase of his career. He returned to the planning division to do great work on a variety of projects. Whereas 24 years later, Kim is finally retiring, and Kim has run, well, I mentioned that he was a runner, over 40,000 miles in the last 32 years. That's a lot of miles. And has gone through about 100 pairs of running shoes. None with more free time, not with more free time at hand. We foresee that he's going to have many, many more miles to run, and also more pairs of shoes to wear, and we commend you for that. Now that for that to be resolved, that the Ventura County Board of Supervisors takes great pleasure in honoring Kim for his many years of exemplary service to the County of Ventura and wishes him well in his retirement. This is really does not do any justice to you, but I want to commend you for all the good work, and I want to go down and, and hand this uh, resolution to you, and I'm sure that the other board members have some other good things to say about you. Thank you. I, I feel like Supervisor Zaragoza stole you from my district. Uh, all of the time, in the, in the 10 years I've been here, I assumed you were a resident uh, of the city of Ventura. So uh, I, uh, I, I, somehow it just doesn't feel right uh, that I somebody else doing this resolution. But I've really enjoyed working with you. you, 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 you You've been the consummate professional, and I think that that's the best compliment you can get as you go out, and, and, and that is that uh, I really feel like you, you genuinely tried not to respond to political pressure, but just call it like you saw it in terms of what was the, the right decision for a staff person to be making. So thank you very much. Uh, Supervisor Long. Yes, also thank you. True public servant. You're appreciated in both your... Um, dedication, your due diligence in every piece of work you've done with us for the county, and and uh, you've helped to grow some uh, new county employee here, and uh, not new any longer, matured well on the job. Um, but you know, you've been very, very conscientious, Kim, in your years of work with us and and with the public, um, very responsive. Um, and and just know you know your subjects well, and have always served the public well. So appreciated. Thank you. Thank you. Super nice I would just say also enjoy your retirement and thanks for giving your biggest part of your life to this county and doing such a great job for the county and making this a better place. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Powers, do you want to comment? Yeah, just real quick, yes. Uh, Kim worked with you many years ago and always kind and gracious uh, throughout. And uh, I just appreciate uh, all, all that you've done here. Thank you. 
I, I too just appreciate your professionalism, your intelligence. I think of you as the uh, curator of our county's history. Uh, and then also just the fact that it, the respect that you have gained from the community. And I know some people that are, you know, strong, you know, fighters for, you know, what they want to see, the, the land use in the county, but they always have tremendous respect for you. And I think that says a lot that uh, your professionalism emanates throughout. So thank you for your many years with the county, your good work, and, and really being a role model for others. Thank you. Oh, well, thank you. I wasn't planning on doing this, but I want to thank the board, of course, for those very, very kind words. Uh, you know, what to say. I, I was happy to follow uh, CDC's and Rodney's presentation because it reminded me I was very lucky to be the residential land use section supervisor when Rancho Sespe came through the mill. And we recommended approval of it, so I'm very happy to, <laughs> <laughs> happy to say that we did that. But there's been so many projects I've worked on over the years that are just fascinating, and always the highlight was to come down to the board and have the board consider them, as well as the public to consider the issues. And um, I want to thank the board for all their support. I've worked with many boards over the years, like I don't know how many, maybe nine different boards, perhaps <laughs> in that time frame. So I mean, thank you very much. Do you have any family members here? I have my daughter Laura here. Uh, and, uh, and take a photo with it. Oh, thank you. You're too kind. Didn't this lift all the board members here? Oh, great. Fabulous. 38 years is a long time. <laughs> <laughs> You've been around that I, long. I understand you also worked for the city, huh? I did, yes. Same time we did. Yeah, it was Aaron. And, oh, this way. Okay. This, this move over here. Right here. Right here. Yeah, I got a couple. So let's do one more, okay? On the count of three. One, two, three. Great. Thank you very much. Remarkable career indeed. Our next 1030 uh, item is item 26, and this uh, is a recommendation of Supervisor Long. Uh, yes. Yes. yes, it is, and I'll pass it on over to you. Um, thank you, Supervisor. Um, and I, I would like to certainly invite up Dr. Bob Gonzalez and Paula Renz to the podium as I introduce this item. Um, it is my pleasure, as we've just honored someone who has uh, dedicated years to the service of the county and to the public, we have an opportunity here through a uh, very generous um, legacy, uh, a woman whose name is known throughout the county, to be able to accept a donation that is going to benefit our county, our hospital, and generations of children in our county. And it's my honor just to be able to introduce this. The Medical Center, uh, as, as all the board knows, we've been in the process of opening our first pediatric intensive care unit in the county. Um, and it's, we're very fortunate to have um, tremendous support for this, both the board, um, the um, leadership, and, and now certainly, uh, and always has with, a, with the community, and to be able to have um, a PICU that's going to uh, serve children, as I said, for generations ahead. Um, our public hospital 
is very strong, um, both operationally, but also in its mission and its values, and the commitment to support um, our community to be the strength of that safety net is going to be so enhanced by the Harriet H. Samuelson Foundation and their gift to our PICU today. Um, I had the pleasure of hearing uh, of this opportunity last fall, and I'm, I'm thank you for l allowing me to introduce this, and I certainly will uh, turn this over to you. But um, the board letter certainly calls out uh, who Harriet H. Samuelson is and was in this county, and her uh, again, her love for children, her love for this county, and the foundation's ongoing gifts to the county in many ways. Um, but today, particularly for to enhance our goal to have the best pick you in this county. I'll turn this over now, please, to Dr. Bob. Thank you, board members and, and Mike. Um, the uh, Pediatric Intensive Care Unit, of course, is an extraordinarily important service uh, for the children and families of Ventura County. And uh, we've had uh, multiple occasions in which critically ill children have had to be transported out by helicopter uh, to uh, a hospital 60 miles away, 70 miles away. And um, that is uh, dramatic in itself, but the impact it has when a child's in an ICU for days and weeks on end and that family having to live their life, moving back and forth between the hospital and their home, trying to care for their other children is, is really um, an incredible impactor on, on their family life and something that uh, stays with them. So we're really proud to uh, be able to bring forth the Pediatric Intensive Care Unit. I want to thank Mike for his role in uh, starting this project and uh, providing leadership, and uh, I'm, I'm truly proud of this as are uh, the entire staff at VCMC. Uh, we really do want to thank the Samuel and foundation for this support and also our medical research foundation. I'm going to um, turn this over to Paul who's going to say a few words. So it is truly a pleasure to be here and to be a part of this, uh, this day. One of the things that we as a system pride ourselves on is the ability to fill gaps and needs in the community. Uh, and this is once again a testimony to that effort. Uh, this is something that's critical to pediatric care in this county and, and we have a lot of wonderful support in the community, which is critical. So as we all know, the reason we're able to bring this forward is because you have a financially stable system, a system that uh, takes the financial integrity and the cost effectiveness of healthcare delivery very seriously. The other reason is because we believe in quality. We have quality staff and physicians that are committed and that are passionate about healthcare delivery. And the third most important component, and I think all of you would agree, and it's a philosophy that Mike Powers has ingrained in us in the agency, and Dr. Gonzalez has, of course, followed through, and that is, that is our engagement with the community, uh, our commitment to work with the community and have the opportunity to, to foster relationships where we can share and the benefit of, of serving the community, uh, serving those that really need our services and depend on our public health care system. So today, you know, of course, Today we have here the Medical Resource Foundation, and we have a number of members here present, and they have taken the time to spend with us because they believe in our system, and they want to be here to support the Samuelson Foundation and their wonderful contribution to the, to the agency. Um, so I'd just like to mention who's here. Of course, you have Vicki Chandler, who is our uh, president of our Medical Resource Foundation. Uh, you have Bob Bain, who's the chairman of the board, of our board, uh, and he's a retired attorney with the city of Ventura. We have uh, Roy Schneider. Um, I think he might have made it, if not. Um, we have Roger Case with Roger Case Realty. Uh, he's our secretary of the board. Christine Parrish, who is our vice president, who is the vice president of U.S. Bank and our, the treasurer of our board. Uh, Kevin Samita, uh, a CPA and the co-chair of Budget Finance Committee. Uh, and, of course, you have Dr. Gonzalez and myself who proudly serve on the Medical Resource Foundation Board. Um, Mr. Chivaroli. Oh, Mr. Rick Chivaroli with Chivaroli and Associates. You never know when he's going to show up. <laughs> he's always there. So it's important that I mention these names and where they come from because that really is testimony to how we engage the community and the support that we garner from individuals that really educate others in the community about who we are and what we do. 
Um, and that's really about what we're here today. So the Samuelson Foundation, through the work of the Medical, Medical Resource Foundation, has now really engaged the healthcare agency in our effort, in our mission, our passion for children. And, you know, this is, I have to tell you, it's, it's not a precedent in terms of the dollar amount. This is really a precedent about the agency engaging individuals and in community to share in that effort. We more than likely will have other people that will be interested in contributing, and we will take those on a case-by-case -case basis um, because we have a lot to offer the community and a lot to share. So um, one of the things that's really important is to give your board a status on the PICU in terms of, of its development. Uh, Dr. Before I introduce uh, and have uh, Mr. Compton and Mr. Yabu come up from who are trustees of the foundation, I really want Dr. Markham to give your board and both foundations a status on where we stand with the, the PICU. Good. Great. While Dr. Markham is coming up, you know this is a team effort, and one of the leaders in our system is Cindy Cole, who has championed this and worked closely with Dr. Markham and our, our physician medical staff. Okay. Cindy Cole is here. <laughs> and Jenny Barstead, who is going to be the manager, nurse manager of our pediatric intensive care unit. Uh -huh. So, Dr. Markham. Members of the board, Mr. Powers, uh, as Mike was saying, our development of the pediatric ICU is really a team effort. And uh, the first thing I'd like to do before I give you an update is to thank all the members of the board and Mr. Powers for your support in helping us build this PICU at Ventura County Medical Center. Uh, the second uh, people I'd like to thank is the community. Uh, without the community, uh, specifically uh, the trustees of the Harriet Samuelson Foundation, uh, our PICU uh, would not be able to be in the place that uh, development that it is today. So I thank the community and the overwhelming amount of support we've received from the community. Uh, and then lastly, I'd like to uh, thank the wonderful people uh, that work at Ventura County Medical Center that help us uh, build the pediatric ICU. Uh, exactly where we're at is uh, we are uh, aiming for a date of October 2011 to open our pediatric oh, ICU. Uh, we are currently renovating the space, uh, which has been a big project. Uh, once we are complete with renovation, we will have Oshpod come by and give us their stamp of approval. And then uh, from that point, we will have the state come by and give us li license for the six beds. Uh, we've been working internally in training our uh, staff members at Ventura County Medical Center to uh, learn how to take care of critically ill patients, uh, critically ill children, and we've also been uh, working externally. And I'd like to really uh, uh, thank the support that we've had externally, uh, specifically from our neighboring hospitals. Uh, the attitude has been, what can we do to help you? And um, how can we help you in this in this venture? And so I'd also like to thank the uh, neighboring hospitals in uh, helping us build our PICU. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, John. Thank you, Dr. Markham. And so if I could ask uh, Mr. Compton and, and Mrs. Yabut join us, our guests of honors, if you will. <laughs> Welcome, and thank you. My name is Robert Compton, and I am a co-trustee of the foundation. I'd just like to affirm that uh, uh, we would uh, would feel that the pediatric intensive care unit is going to be a valuable asset in the county and a positive contribution to the children's health, which, as you know, is uh, one of the main causes that Fair Harry Samuelson was committed to. Uh, we hope you'll uh, confirm the agreement and you'd like to move forward with it. <laughs> and I know that Harriet would be very proud if this ever happened. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you so very much. If, if 
you don't mind if your board would uh, allow us to take a picture with yeah. some of the members of the board? I would, I would like that we would all do that. Um, this is quite a gift, um, as I said, a gift that is just going to just benefit us for decades, the children in this county. Um, and But why don't we first, if we might, Madam Chair, take a vote? I, th I think that's in order. Yeah. <laughs> and I put the motion forward to approve all three recommended actions. All right. This is a motion and a one very happily taken. Thank you very much for your generosity. And let's have um, the Medical Resource Foundation board members join us and Cindy and everybody who's a part of this come down and take a picture. Mike, all of us. See the lens? Good. All right. One more. Okay. Just for safety here, everybody close your eyes. When I count to three, open them. One, two, three. Great. Thank you so much. That's exciting. I look forward to cutting the ribbons. And, it, and I think it is uh, encouraging that we can do these kind of things and maybe reach, uh, continue a, an outreach campaign to see my, there might be other facilities that also could be named yeah. after generous benefactors and maybe looking at board policies for that and uh, suggestions on how we might do that. Because in this economic times, uh, we need all the public-private partnerships that uh, we can get. So. I know our, our CEO's office will be looking at other opportunities and how we can proceed. The next item on the agenda, I believe, is one that's being brought forward by Supervisors Bennett and Long, and this is our 11 a.m. time certain, and it is item 27, and I do have a few cards on it. So um, whoever would be taking on that uh, board item? Okay. Thank you. Um, Madam Chair, I'll be, be, be very brief in my comments and very brief in my PowerPoint. Uh, so I just have uh, three quick slides, so if we could just pop, uh, pop the first one up. Um, just for the benefit uh, of the public, uh, there I think is a particular um, need for us to try to get as much local employment out of uh, the, the spending of our construction dollars on the hospital as possible. The Ventura County, overall, the Ventura County unemployment rate is 10.3%. Next slide. Um, but construction employment is down more than 50%. And, and there are so many uh, uh, construction workers um, here in Ventura walking around uh, that have uh, 
uh, have real need for an employment, and as much as we can uh, try to uh, get those people employed, that would certainly be helpful for the Ventura County economy. Next slide. Project has a $100 million uh, payroll, hundreds of construction jobs, and uh, if you take that and multiply it through, it's not just those construction jobs, but then those people will spend more dollars um, here in the economy, and it, uh, uh, an economist will tell you that the multiplier effect of a dollar spent is it's spent about five times over the course of the year. Uh, and we could certainly use that. So um, I certainly uh, here to speak uh, in favor of uh, our recommendation, which is to ask the CEO and uh, County Council to examine and come back to us after the August break with uh, uh, recommendations in terms of options uh, for how we can um, uh, increase as much as possible uh, local construction, I mean local employment uh, in the hiring. So Supervisor Long. Yeah, just uh, thank you. Um, certainly to to join in on this to uh, um, this is going to be the biggest um, uh, public project uh, that's done in this county probably for at least a decade um, I don't know of another one we have on the books um, I certainly know that this is one that has been uh, guided uh, uh, well by both the board and and the hospital leadership for both the uh, necessity of doing this project um, the the um, uh, opportunity to uh, put the creative funding together to do it. Uh, as, as I said in the board letter, the uh, multiplier effect of, of having local hire um, is many times over. Uh, the value of really reaching out to uh, people who have been unemployed, are unemployed, um, the uh, impacts we've seen ripple through our even uh, our economy as a result of people who have uh, lost their jobs or haven't been able to do the work that they're trained to do. Uh, we see that in our caseloads at our hospital and our caseloads in our, our social service programs. Um, and these uh, these are our people who uh, are our neighbors and our. Um, our friends and, and people, we should be really looking to see how we can assist them in uh, as well as assisting um, a very good project and making sure that uh, uh, there's benefits all the way around from doing this. So to take a look at this, I think, is a, is a valid request um, and, and something we should all have um, uh, interest in doing for the greater benefit of the community. Mm -hmm. Madam Chair, I know we have some speakers, but I... Um I want to thank the supervisors, uh, Bennett and Long, for bringing this uh, before the full board. I'm very supportive of, uh, of creating more jobs here in Ventura County, and especially when we see uh, the 50 percent uh, unemployment, you know, and our uh, construction jobs, uh, you know, that's very critical. I'm very supportive also because I believe that we have a lot of skilled, good paying, uh, uh, that this will create skilled uh, uh, jobs, you know, for the community, the type that uh, I think that we need uh, uh, during the construction of this hospital. And uh, as we mentioned in the, uh, in the report, it's a, it's a multiplier, it's a two point uh, uh, plus percent multiplier that's going to help the community by creating one job and create two and a half other jobs. And, and I think that uh, that one hundred and seventy some million dollar project is a is a project that will help you know, the the economy. So I'm very supportive of the uh, of this proposal, and uh, and I think it's going to be very positive for the community. And and also I believe they have we have a lot of skilled workers here that can benefit from that too. So I'm very supportive of the of this um, request at this time. All right, so we go ahead and uh, call the cards then. I have uh, three, I guess, six, six speakers. Uh, first one's Anna Valle, followed by uh, Maricela Morales. Good morning. We having a good time? <laughs> good morning, Chair um, Person Parks and members of the board. My name is Ana Maria Valle, and I am here today representing our LULAC chapters and members throughout Ventura County as a member of our board of directors. LULAC strongly supports the hiring of local workers for publicly funded construction projects. There is an undeniable benefit to hiring locally by ensuring that those dollars are spent in our county, helping our local economy, and benefiting those in need of jobs. As you know, our county unemployment rate is over 10%, and many families are struggling in these challenging economic times. 
in particular Latinos and Latinas, are disproportionately impacted by unemployment. We believe that Ventura County residents fully support utilizing local workers and would rather hire locally for projects funded by their tax dollars. This project provides an opportune moment to create local jobs and thus reduce unemployment. While we may not solve the serious unemployment rate, the Ventura County Medical Central Hospital replacement project can have a sustained impact for the years it will take to complete this project, as you well noted. As our elected representatives, you have a great opportunity to maximize the benefit to our local economy, and we encourage that you do everything possible to enact a local hiring component for the Ventura County Medical Center Replacement Hospital Project. This will significantly impact and benefit our community. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Valle. Our next speaker, Maricela Morales, followed by Rodney Cobos. Good morning, esteemed chair and members of the Board of Supervisors. My name is Maricela Morales, and I'm with the Central Coast Alliance United for a Sustainable Economy, cause. Um, this is very exciting, um, and uh, from our perspective, it um, doesn't come um, you know, soon enough, <laughs> um, but we're very glad that it's here. At your Board of Supervisors meeting of two years ago, on August 11, 2009, COS presented public comment regarding the Board's opportunity at that time to incorporate local hire components on projects uh, made possible through the Federal Stimulus Funding, or ARA funding. At that point, the County of Ventura had been allocated 136 million over a number of projects. So as was pointed out by Member Long, this one project um, is, is much larger than those several projects. To date, local hire components have not been incorporated into local building and construction projects. And as a result, Ventura County uh, residents have uh, lost opportunities for local employment. Um, in fact, and unfortunately, the Ventura County unemployment rates um, of today uh, have not changed as compared to two years ago. And so in, in the handout, we have the compare, uh, comparable rates. And so in July of 2009, the county unemployment was 10.2, so just a 0.1 percent lower. Um, than today. And um, there are certain communities in our area that throughout this entire time have had high above average rates, county rates. And those cities that have consistently been uh, disproportionately impacted are the cities of Santa Paula, Fillmore, and Oxnard. Um, but other cities that have had above average county unemployment rates consistently are the cities of Ojai and Port Wainimi. Um, that's in terms of concentration, but if we look at numbers, um, the, the cities include Oxnard, Simi Valley, and Thousand Oaks, uh, which right now is tied with Ventura. So whether we look at it in terms of concentration or we look at it in terms of numbers of people that are unemployed, um, all cities in this county uh, are impacted. And so this local hire uh, component and provision is one that benefits all districts of this county. Um, I'd like to point out that it's important um, to align uh, the local co uh, higher components to the disproportionate impact in different communities, um, and that also successful local higher hiring components can include apprenticeship provisions, and this is a great opportunity to expand job opportunities, particularly to women and people of color that are underrepresented in the building and construction trades. So we encourage you to include that aspect of the local higher components. In closing, it's been at least two years since the people of Ventura County in record numbers have sought work and not found it. Today, the County Board of Supervisors can take action to reduce local unemployment by incorporating this local hire in the construction of the replacement hospital project. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Morales. Uh, Rodney Cobos, followed by uh, Marcelo Crisari. Crisari. Good morning, Madam Chair Parks, Board, Board of Supervisors, uh, Mr. Powers and County Staff. My name is Rodney Cobos. I'm a 42-year uh, Ventura County resident. <clears throat> I want to start off uh, this morning with, with a little quote. There is no social program in this country 
that is as important as a good job that pays well, that gives someone an opportunity to go to work, have some security, have benefits, and take care of their family and have a good life. And that was a former, former U.S. Senator from South Dakota, Dakota uh, Byron uh, Dorgan. I'm a plumber by trade, and some 17 years ago, I was very fortunate to have, to have the opportunity to uh, be part of a local uh, plumbing apprenticeship program while receiving the GI Bill and worked as a journeyman plumber throughout uh, the county on uh, numerous projects. The past few years I've seen a change in the local uh, economy's workforce and I have uh, some concerns with contractors, employers, not living up to their responsibility in the uh, terms lowest responsible bidder. It is my opinion that their responsibility should be to the county residents to where this work is being performed. I have seen in many cases where out of county and in some cases out of state contractors who have performed work in this county have employed zero county residents. These unscrupulous employers bring their workforce with them, oftentimes underbidding our local contractors, and take our ta tax dollars elsewhere. Uh, I just uh, want to reiterate what uh, Supervisor Long and Supervisor Bennett presented to the board. There are uh, three uh, negative impacts to contractors utilizing a uh, non-local workforce. The first one, it denies jobs to local construction workers who are permanent county residents. Two, because of the differences in the amount of uh, spending between a, a local and a non-local workforce, there's le less, less money circulating uh, within the local economy, and as a result, does not create those secondary jobs. And lastly, because of spending locally, a smaller amount of local sales tax revenue is generated. Unfortunately, the past few years have been more challenging than others in finding construction work employment. As you are well aware, we will have and we will continue to experience high rates of unemployment in this county unless we as a county take action. We all agree that for the most part, government does not create jobs. The economy creates jobs. Employers create jobs. But what local, local government can do is cultivate and facilitate an environment that supports family sustaining wages and local jobs so that we as taxpayers don't have to uh, or we won't be subjected to higher taxes and uh, decreased uh, public services. In conclusion, Madam Chair, I thank you for allowing me to address the board. I commend the Board of Supervisors for bringing this local hiring issue up for discussion and giving serious consideration to implementing a local uh, hiring provision on the uh, Ventura County Medical Center Replacement Clinic. Thank you very much. And uh, Mr. Crespi, is it Marcello? Yeah. Marcello Crespi with the Bricklayers Local 4. Good morning, Mr. Powers and board members. I have been a resident of Ventura County for the last 24 years. I work here. I raised my family here. My youngest son was born at Community Memorial Hospital. I'm in favor of this project going forward, and I also would like to imply that I would like to see local hire, local help to generate more jobs. I have about 130 brothers that work in the trade like I do. We watch projects come in and out of the area, done by out of, out of the area contractors, one being, first I'll start with a wave, which the masonry contractor went bankrupt on that particular project. The other one, Soho Apartment Complex on Matura Avenue. And right now, this Del Encanto, uh, Encanto, Paseo Del Encanto right here on Thompson and Oak, this being built, all the masonry is being done by a, an Orange County out of the area contractor. This does not generate any work for us, does not stimulate our economy. Uh, I'm in pro of local hire, local help, and this would be a good chance 
for you all to help generate some jobs to stimulate our local economy, which we all know is struggling. Anyways, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Steve Sweeting, followed by our last speaker, Jim Gilman. Good morning, board members. My name is Steve Sweeting. I reside in East Ventura and have lived in the county all my life. I've been a sheet metal worker for the past 35 years and have served my apprenticeship at Ventura College in the late 70s. I'm here today on behalf of many of my friends and family, not only for sheet metal workers, but for all construction trades to endorse a local hire agreement between the County of Ventura and the general contractors, and most important, their subcontractors for work to be formed, be performed at the new wing. I have seen many county projects over the years, and it's common for these projects to be awarded to contractors outside the county. When this happens, they typically bring in their own workforce outside of Ventura County. It only makes sense to me that our county residents who are the ones using the facilities and, the, and whose tax dollars help fund the facilities to be the ones to build the facilities. Again, I am here today to endorse local hire agreement. Thank you. Thank you. And our last speaker, Jim Gelmer. Gelman with uh, BBA, BA PAC. Good job. Thank you. <laughs> Try. Good morning, Chairperson Parks, members of the board. My name is Reverend Jim Gilmer. I'm with the newly formed Black and Brown Alliance of Greater Oxnard and BAYPAC, which stands for the Black American Political Action Coalition of Ventura County. Um, first of all, I'm honored to be part of uh, this wonderful opportunity to have a local hire initiative. And I've heard and read uh, the great presentation relative to the number of jobs that we'll create, and I'm very excited about that. For the past year, I've been involved in a lot of voter outreach for disengaged voters under 35. We did an event um, after our Juneteenth celebration in downtown Oxnard, and we had about 300 people in attendance, and a lot of young men of color, African American, Latino, some uh, former construction workers, but a lot of unemployed young men. and. Just to put a real face on this, I know we're talking about economics and jobs, but people are depressed and stressed out because of the economy. And the spirits are very low. They think the system is broken. We did a random sort of survey of the audience and asked how many of you out there need a job. And it was pretty sad to see, but very close to your statistics, about 50% of the people in there, many males of color, raised their hands. So I can tell you that the social equity enhancements that this will create over the long haul is more than just jobs. I'm here to ask you to support this wholeheartedly, and I'm in partnership with you with many of my community representatives that we will do all we can because this is real, it's timely, it's an idea whose time has come, it will lift the spirits of our community, and we want to partner with you in this successful endeavor. Thank you so much. And thank the supervisors for taking the lead on this. God bless. Thank you for your comments. Uh, at this time, then, we'll go back to the supervisors. Well, just to say um, thank you all for being here to speak to this. Um, certainly, each one of you talked about um, those who are unemployed in our community, um, those who are trades and professionals and, and um, workers who have lived in, uh, for probably decades here in our community. Uh, I, I think the um, uh, importance of, of uh, s moving this for some analysis uh, of the CEO and county council um, is to keep in mind, um, again, the multiplier of, of local hire, the benefits that, um, of those taxpayer dollars that are being used to build this project that um, that, that come full circle. Uh, so my, my, my interest in this is um, we know that, and I already said this, we, are, we know that we have people that you spoke of this morning 
who are already using our other services because they've been unemployed for months and cases a couple years and that this project is at least a four year project so i strongly support we at least take a very strong look at this opportunity for local hire supervisor Zaragoza you want to yeah again i want to share and i want to thank the speakers and like i said i do i'm very supportive of uh of creating jobs here for our skill workers and and this was shared you know the multiplying effect that it's going to have uh for the community is going to assist us and i know that all the speakers that spoke are i i know them i've worked with uh with uh of quite a few all of you for that matter and gilmore was over the at the juneteenth you know over at plaza park and talking to the individuals there and talking to tony and talking to manisela and those folks we need those jobs and i i think it's important i think it's going to be a positive effect to all of us if uh if this uh if this happens to hire the local workers and i want to thank you for being here today and i'm very supportive of that thank you any other comments um, thank you. I appreciate uh, the, the comments that we heard here today. Um, you know, this is a complicated issue, this issue of, of, of local hire. And so I just want to be clear that what we're asking for is a report back on the options uh, that are out there, um, what we can do, what we can't do, um, what are solutions to some of the hurdles that maybe are out there? Are, are there creative things that staff can come up with? We've got a nice break here while we're, while we're gone. Um, and staff have recommendations after they, after they did the research of, of, of this. Um, so it, it, you know, to, to get at this. And the other thing I just point out is just want to remind everybody, um, this is a remarkable project that we have going forward here at, at the hospital. Um, you know, the hospital's coming forward and because of a very good management and, and, and the way some of the funding has, has been set up, we're, we're attempting to finance this from hospital revenues and that's, uh, it does not happen very many places in, in, in this country right now. Uh, and that it's also, this is a project that's serving the underserved population in Ventura County. So regardless of what we do here, just every time we talk about this hospital project, I think we need to remind everybody that um, we're out there uh, building something for the underserved population that's going to last um, many, many generations. And that's a, a tremendous legacy uh, and a tremendous important thing for us here in Ventura County. So, Madam Chair, one, one more thing that was said too by the speakers. You know, I know that the uh, Building Trace has an excellent apprenticeship program, and I believe those uh, young individuals can really use uh, that job uh, training also under the apprenticeship program that that they have. So, I just wanted to echo that again. Thank you. And uh, I've been a uh, you know strong proponent of you know buy local campaigns. I I would be in support of this if it can be done in terms of being able to use local labor. Um, I I wonder one of the lines in the report talks about the fact that we have pre-qualified a bid, bids from three out-of-county firms. So I think that will be something that will have to be reviewed also, you know, if we can require them to utilize labor that's within our county. And, you know, certainly it would be good for the economy if we can do it and, and what the costs of that would be. Supervisor Ford. Let me just say, I know that I think Supervisor Bennett was pretty clear. There's a lot of state hurdles and other issues you have to deal with with law and beer. But there's no question if the opportunity with some of these employers that are these contractors, I mean, it sure seems like it's a lot cheaper to have somebody local be doing it than shipping people from Orange County, San Francisco, especially on a long-term project. So hopefully, however we work something out, that that is going to work out in the long term. Because a short-term project, I can bring some of my own workers up, I guess, for a month or so. That's easy put them in a hotel. But hopefully on a long-term basis, got to try to figure out and try to balance that, that you know, the, really stimulates what we're doing here. I mean, we got this CMH is doing a project. I mean, this is really going to be good for our whole our whole community. At the same time, trying to protect taxpayers because you get the other issue of, you know, you don't want it to get too expensive to do it, but I don't think we can do it because I think we got quality people here and quality contractors and people that can do it at the same price or hopefully even less because they live here. So trying to figure out how to balance all that, I know that you're giving county council a, a tall uh, issue to, to try to deal it, but I agree with what Supervisor Bennett said. Try to be creative. Try to find different ways to make it all come together so the people of this county can enjoy the benefits of the the project that, that's going on. So I'm I'm looking forward to see what they come back with. So, Mr. Power. That's all. Yeah, just to <clears throat> really understand the mandate and the importance of it. These projects don't come along very often. 
I mean, this is a big project. It's going to be a huge economic driver potentially for us locally, and we need to seize every opportunity we can to incorporate our local, excellent local contractors here as part of this, because it will be a source of pride. This is going to be uh, a really high-quality uh, project as well. It's something that the community can really rally around and come together on. So there are some hurdles to doing it, but we've got to look at how we can support if we can or preventing hurdles if they're there to local contractors being part of this project. And training supervisors, Erico, so you mentioned that. I think there's going to be a good portion of apprenticeships uh, as part of this project, which is because it's so rare, it's a unique opportunity for local folks and families as well. So we'll, and we'll get into it and, and report back to you. Sir. Where, where are we in the uh, process of going out to bid? Well, the, the bidding process is, is underway right now. Okay. And, and so we do have right now three qualified bidders uh, who have bid uh, on the project. And so, uh, you know, that, that's where we are. So if we wanted to, for example, incentivize the use of um, in-county labor, would that be something that then may need to go re out to you know, go out to bid again on? Once we've already gone to bid, we've put the documents together and the requirements okay. that have to be met. My, my, my understanding is that we haven't done the request for proposal for the specific hospital yet because we're still, we still, it, it, we just, we pre-qualified right. these contractors, but we have not gone out with an actual, okay, this is what we want, because we haven't done that, uh, we haven't completed the footprint yet uh, for the hospital. Once we have the footprint completed, then we say, okay, to our pre-qualified bidders, this is what we want. And that's why this is so timely, because when we go out there and say, this is what we want, we're adding another component. This is what we want in this design-build process, and this is what we want in terms of the process with regards to whatever components of local hiring. Yeah, just what to be happens. clear, that, that's exactly right. That you know, We are still in the process of development, developing the design standards to give to the qualified bidders. What we've done is identify the qualified bidders, because these are big projects and there's not many construction companies that can do them. So we have three, but yes, we haven't even given them the design yet right. for them to So this is, this is still appropriate in terms of time. time, 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 time. And, and then, it, you know, if it's successful here, we can do it elsewhere, too. I know we're, you know, building a, a you know, re rehabbing a whole building in uh, Thousand Oaks where we had our open borders there, and uh, that, that's going to become a county health clinic, too. So the idea that we could do this here, we may be able to do it in other places, too. So I'm looking forward to seeing what the results are. Supervisor Zarago. So we're in the RFQ process, is that what it is, Michael? And then, then we go into the, for the RFP. Then. Okay. Okay, just want to make sure that we're not, uh, our timing is good on this. Okay, so we have Madam a Chair, on I'd, the table. Yeah, I, I guess I just I, we have a, we have the motion that's that's in our recommendation. I just want to add to it because I think there's a broad consensus here on the board to, in, to incorporate the comments that we made here with regards to uh, the specific thing that I said that uh, you know we, we want the report on all the options, recommendations. What can we do? What can't we do? Uh, so that we have a full understanding of this, and then um, you know what are uh, solutions, creative uh, ideas, and what are recommendations of staff as they come. Back. So and I would also look more. at costs also. Okay. But we'll have that anyway. Okay. Well, and, uh, yeah, there's, we must look at that, but there's also, I'd, I'd ask for some analysis of cost benefit of local mm -hmm. hire too. Exactly. And the multiplying effect on the, on the film too. Okay. okay. We have a motion from Supervisor Long, a second from Supervisor Bennett. Will we please vote? Thank you. Okay. And that passes unanimously. So we look forward to getting that report after our break. And I do believe that completes our entire agenda. Yay. And we'll stand adjourned. <laughs>